it's all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the ways. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread and sound and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea. Echo back ye ocean caves. Earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing of love, the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy strays. Sing in triumph for the truth. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Hear the wind, a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation, full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Mick Firestone, and I'm the platform chair this morning. Happy to be so. Uh, we have just a few announcements this morning, and I want to welcome everyone who is tuning in by live streaming online and everyone that is here in the sanctuary. So the first announcement is that we know that next Sunday, the 25th, there will be a church work bee. We're going to clean up and straighten up the basement. In preparation for that, a large dumpster is being delivered to the alley out here where normally people can park. There will be no parking available in the alley next Sabbath or during the week after Thursday because uh, of getting ready for the, uh, the big work bee. So no parking out there. We also want to remind everyone to join us next Sabbath for the care facility visitation. So we'll be visiting, I believe it'll be the Doby Road facility again around 2 o'clock. Makes a big difference to the residents out there. And we have announcements from Daniel. Good morning. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that today, after, right immediately following the service, we will have a AV training. So if you are interested in being part of the AV team, please join us up in the balcony immediately following the service, and we will show you the ropes on the sound system, the video system, whatever it is you're interested in learning. We're going to go through it all today. Um, we would love to have you on the team. Uh, this morning, there was one, only one person out of the three spots scheduled, uh, and that person wasn't able to make it. So I have some wonderful volunteers that uh, volunteer to fill in today. And we would love to have you be part of that team so we can uh, fill our schedule and always make sure that we have a, a wonderful media streaming service for those online. Uh, if anyone's listening online and you want to stop by after the service, please come and join us. All right. Thank you so much. Good morning, I'm Evelyn Lederber, and I'd like to invite you all this afternoon and every Sabbath afternoon until we finish Patriarchs and Prophets to join us at three o'clock in the corner room back there, the university, um, wait, Bible University, get that right. 
Bible University room at three o'clock every Sabbath afternoon unless something you know, that we do in the whole church changes that situation, but you'll know about that at that time. So I hope you will really look forward to studying that and uh, we'll see what books we can provide for sharing if you don't have your own or we will share each other's books. Thank you. It's time for our introit. I invite you to stand with me. Number 689. This again was a brand new song for me this week. to worship is number 818. It'll also be on the screen. I will start out reading and then you read what the congregation part says or if you're looking at the hymnal, the bold print. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Amen. Please be seated. Hi, my name is Stevie Schultz, and I will be reading The Blind Giver Attitude. But God demonstrates in his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 We worship with our resources because we follow the example of our God, who is a blind giver. When God gives, he rarely focuses on the nature of recipients or even to outcome. He gives out of love faithful to his attribute, he causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain and the righteousness and the unrighteous. In contrast, we incline to give exclusively to what we see and whose outcome we can control. As a result, some have withdrawn from participation in the tithe and regular offerings. Not seeing the direct effort of their contributions, others have resolved to support only local projects rather than worldwide missions far from their eyes. We have a glimpse of what can happen when God's people produce blind giver attitudes. We have heard about the Amazon of Hope, the floating church. It is not known by most of us, even fewer have visited this boat church. However, this project has materialized through the blind giving mindset in 2016. God's children from all over the world pulled funds together to support the 13th Sabbath project and the implemented project that was the floating church, the Amazon of Hope in Brazil. This is the result inspiring in the first 12 per month of operation, the boat church, 286 people were baptized and planted three churches in 2017. And this testimony of Pastor Reno 
who said the Amazon of Hope, the Bow Church, is God's way of saving people who have been forgotten by political, economic, and health systems. God, our example, is involved in a global mission towards those that we see and cannot see, towards those that we know and do not know. This week, as we worship with our tithe and regular offering, we have another opportunity to demonstrate the same global mindset as our God. Will the deacon step up, please? Let us pray. Lord, we are inspired by your universal and blindfold generosity towards humanity. Please help us to be givers in your likeness. And bless everybody in the church and this offering, dear Lord, and may it come to you. In Jesus' name we pray and we love you. Amen. Time for our morning prayer. As much as possible, will you kneel with me? Our heavenly King, we praise your holy name. You are so majestic. You are so powerful and wise and holy. Your plan for our redemption is awesome and terrible and, and wonderful at the same time that Jesus Christ, the Prince of Heaven, would come to this earth and die on our behalf, a terrible, awful, painful death, taking on the sins of the whole world. But Lord, you did it. You did it. And as a result, we can approach you and we can glory in the promise that we can live forever in paradise with you. We study this week, Lord, about dying. Dying to the world, dying to ourselves. But when we die to ourselves, Lord, you can fill us with your Holy Spirit that Christ may live in us. As the Apostle Paul has said, that we have died to ourselves, but Christ lives in us. We long for this, Lord. We praise you for this mysterious phenomenon of Christ living through us. And we pray that as Christ lives in us, the Holy Spirit would build in us, would mold us to have the character and the mind of Jesus Christ and the heart of Christ with the love and the compassion and the forgiveness and the mercy that Jesus shows. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you, asking you to make us over in your image. Thank you for this Sabbath day.
when we can worship and praise our holy God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm studying at MSU. Today I'm gonna read Romans chapter 10, verse 4 to 8 for NIV version. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith, but the right uh, says, do not say in your heart. Who will ascend into heaven or who will descend into the deep but what does it say the word is near you it is in your mouth and in your heart that is the message concerning faith that we proclaim thank you good morning and happy sabbath everyone for those who do not know me, my name is Mark Howard. I work as the Associate Director of Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Department for the Michigan Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And I work right down the hall from the pastor's wife, who probably thought she would escape me today, these crazy people down the hall, but uh, Pastor Jermaine had asked if I could cover for him today while he's at a wedding in, I was gonna say sunny California. Um, I might be say, say you know, the. the you get the fires and everything going as I don't know if I want to necessarily be out there today so I'm glad to be here and here with you now I like coming to the university church because by the time I park and take that mile walk to the church it clears my mind no I didn't walk a mile to the church but it is always a you got to plan for the parking thing when you're coming to university church oh yes need to take time for parking but this morning, I would like to turn our attention to that passage we were reading in the scriptures in Romans chapter 10. Before I do so, I want to pray and ask the Lord to guide our time in his word. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to kneel and do that if you'd bow your heads while I pray. Father in heaven, again, we are so thankful for the Holy Sabbath day. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us as we open your word. Lord, may he lead us into an understanding of the truth, not just an intellectual understanding, Father, but a practical understanding that we may reflect the glory of Jesus to the world around us and hasten the day of his coming. We ask it in his name. Amen. Now, I had originally entitled today's message the righteousness of the law, taking or righteousness of faith, taking from Romans 14. But as I thought about it, I have retitled it, Christ is the end of the law. And you'll see that when you come to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, and we're going to look at verse 4, where our scripture reading was. Uh, we're going to end up journeying back a little bit more to get context. But I just want to start here. Romans 10, verse 4, the Bible says... For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And then the apostle goes on, which we're going to look at for uh, in just a moment. Uh, it's interesting that you've ever studied the subject of the Sabbath with a non-Sabbath keeper. It may be that this passage came up. And if it didn't come up in that conversation, it came up when the person you were talking to went back and talked to their pastor, and the pastor said, hey, look, the Bible says Christ is the end of the law. And they interpret it to mean that once you have Jesus, you don't need to worry about keeping the law anymore. And that's what Paul's saying. So it's kind of phenomenal to me that, that this passage would be used that way, because when we get done with it today, it's a phenomenal passage on the role of the law in the life of the Christian and in the experience of 
righteousness by faith. And that's what we're really going to get to uh, today. Now, the, if you look at the passage again, Christ is the end of the law. That word end comes from a Greek word, teleos. And the Greek word teleos, according to the Vines Expository Dictionary of, of uh, Greek words used in the New Testament, they define it as the limit or the, the final issue or result, or probably more to the point, the aim or purpose of a thing. So we use it this way. We say, have you ever heard the expression, the end justifies the means? Okay, end, when we use it in that expression, does not mean the end of something. It means the outcome of something, right? The end justifies the means. Well, the outcome is this, and so it doesn't matter what I did to get there, okay? But that, that is the way that this word end is not always in every case, but it's often used in Scripture. I'll give you some examples. Let's look at uh, Philippians chapter 3. And, and I just want to lay some groundwork before we go into that passage in Romans uh, chapter, actually, verses 9 and 10. But we're going to Philippians 3, verse 10. Philippians 3 and verse 10. We're looking at the way that word teleos is translated in different places. And you'll see it's translated end oftentimes, as you'll see here, as I get to my page. Philippians 3, verse 10. Now, notice it says here, and that's obviously not the verse I wanted to look at, so I wrote down the wrong verse here. So, we're going to go to my next example, and that's 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Just keep on going to the right. If you get to Hebrews, you went too far. Now, it's interesting, in, and I'm reading in the New King James here this morning. I'll be sharing some different translations. But in 1 Timothy 1, 5, the apostle says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. What word do you think is, trans, is the word teleos found in there? Which, which word do you think is translated from teleos? The same word that says end in Romans chapter 10, the end of the law. It's the word purpose, right? The aim, the outcome of a thing. And so it's interesting. Now, the King James here does say the end of the uh, commandment, but in this particular uh, translation, it, it actually translates it the purpose of the commandment. And again, the idea is the end, the outcome of a thing, which this will all make sense in a little bit. Uh, in fact, the English standard says the outcome, if you were to read the English standard version, the outcome of the commandment, uh, which really isn't saying a lot different from Romans. Peter's just saying that the outcome of keeping the commandment should result in a person living this kind of way. Again, we're just looking at the usage of the word uh, teleos, that's translated end in Romans 10, to go back to Romans 10. So hang with me. I know you're like, where are we going with this? Hang with me. You'll see. Um, also in 1 Peter, or uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, the, the NIV says the end result of the commandment. Uh, if you go with me to James chapter one, uh, 5, rather, so go past the book of Hebrews to the book of James. James chapter 5. And we're looking at verse 11. Again, that, that Greek word teleos that says the end of the law in Romans chapter 10 verse 4 is found here. Verse 11. It says, indeed... We count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the what? The end. And notice the intended by. Does anybody else have the New King James here? What does it look like in your Bible, intended by? It's italics, right? Which means it was supplied by the translators to try to give clarity because without that it just would have said, we've seen the end of the Lord. Well, nobody wants to see the end of the Lord. Why well, is a, 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 
the wicked might want to see the end of the Lord. He's not ending, by the way. But the translators, to clarify this, says, well, it doesn't mean the end of the Lord, like he's coming to an end. It means the end intended by the Lord. Now, what would have happened if they, in Romans 10, would have said, Christ is the end intended by the law? That would have changed it a little bit, which we'll see when we go back to Romans 10. But I just want you to see that this, this word in fact, James 5, 11, the end intended by the Lord. It's the end of the Lord in King James. The new King James that I'm reading from here is the end intended by the Lord. The new American Standard Bible says the outcome intended by the Lord or the outcome of the Lord. The English Standard says the purpose of the Lord. The new international says what the Lord finally brought about. Notice in every case, most translations, the newer ones don't say end because it's the end of the Lord. What does that mean? So they modernize it. Now, the reason that's interesting is because when you come to Romans 10, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law. You'd expect some modernization. Hey, explain that a little bit because we know the law hasn't come to an end. Oh, no. You go to Romans 10, verse 4, King James, New King James, New American Standard, English Standard, all says the end of the law. No attempt to try to clarify it. NIV is not too bad. The culmination but again, the takeaway from many people when they're looking at Romans 10.4 is that Paul's saying that the law is no longer needed when a person comes to Christ. Christ is the end, the culmination. He's fulfilled it. He's done it all so we don't have to. Have you heard that before? That's the mindset that's being portrayed there. Interestingly, just a couple paraphrases that I'll share. The Good News Bible. Have you heard of the Good News Bible? This is how they interpret or translate Romans 10, verse 4. Christ has brought the law to an end so that everyone who believes is put right with God. Now, I want you to think about that. Christ put the law to an end so everyone who believes is right with God. Why aren't we right with God now? Because we're sinners, and what is sin? Law-breaking. Well, let's just get rid of that law, and guess what? You're not a lawbreaker anymore because there isn't a law to break. So what changed? Nothing. Can you imagine that we're put right with God by just getting rid of the law that calls us wrong? And then we're all right with God, and then we're all going to go to heaven and pollute that place like we have this earth. Unless we're changed. You understand what I'm saying? What an interesting translation of Romans 10. Is that what Paul's saying in Romans 10, 4? Or the, the contemporary English version says, this is how they translate it. Christ makes the law no longer necessary for those who become acceptable to God by faith. That's a pretty general understanding in Christianity today, that that's, once you accept Christ, you don't need the law anymore. So you see the tendency to translate the passage is no longer Paul telling us to keep the Ten Commandments, but that the Ten Commandments don't need to be kept anymore. Okay, now we're going to walk through the passage, and it, that's not what it's saying at all, uh, which you would assume, I would think you would assume that I wasn't going to go there today. But I want to think about before I get into the passage again, I just want to process a few things about the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Now, I have to say this. When Pastor Jermaine had asked me to speak, and I was thinking and praying what to speak on, I've actually been working on a series on the law of God. And I've told some of the folks at work. Now, this is the conference office, the Michigan Seventh-day Adventist Conference Office. And I'm explaining, I'm telling the other people, yeah, I'm thinking about doing a series on the law. What do you think is the very next thing I do when I tell them that? I begin to explain why, right? Because even in Adventism, it's like when you say law, it tends to be negative. You're going to talk about the law. I thought you were going to talk about Christ. They say things. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, what has happened when talking about the law of God becomes a negative in the church? Something wrong with that picture, right? So let's think about some things about uh, uh, the law of God for a minute. Let's go to Psalm 119, 172. And I'll be brief with this before I get, because I want to get into this passage. But this is, there's some important things we need to process. First and foremost, Psalm 119, 172. David says, my tongue shall speak of your word for what? All your commandments are righteousness. Now, righteousness is a big theological word. But what's the root word of righteousness? Right. Right. Let me ask you a question. 
Do you think people in this world have an idea of right or wrong? I'm going to tell you there's not a person who exists who doesn't think that some things are right and some things are wrong. Everybody has an idea. They may not be the same. Your idea of right and wrong might not be my idea of right and wrong. So what's the standard of right and wrong? This is exactly what David's addressing. All your commandments are righteousness. In other words, the, 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 the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, and we call it that, the moral law of God defines right from wrong. That's how we know right from wrong. And if time permitted, I would tell you, even the person in the remotest heathen place has a conviction deep down that killing is wrong. Where'd they get it from? Because the law of God speaks. The Spirit works through that and speaks universally. Time doesn't permit for that. But just the idea that God's law is a standard of right and wrong. Let's look at one other uh, text along that uh, line. If you go a little bit further to the book of Isaiah, go to Isaiah 51 with me. Isaiah 51, verse 7. The Lord here is speaking to his people through the prophet Isaiah. Psalm 51, verse 7. He says, listen to me, you who know what? Righteousness. Now he's about to tell us who knows righteousness. Who knows righteousness? You people in whose heart is what? My law. Now these are just a couple verses telling us that the law of God is the standard of right and wrong. When we talk about sin, we're just talking about a violation of the law of God. Sin is what's wrong in God's eyes, and righteousness is what's right in God's eyes. And God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, is the standard of right and wrong. It is the moral authority. So, <laughs> just, just with that understanding, what sense would it ever make to need to get rid of it if you're wanting to live righteously? If you want to live righteously, and the law of God defines righteous living, where's the conflict? Why do I want to get rid of it? I can see why I want to get rid of it if I don't want to live righteously. But if I want to live righteously, there shouldn't be any kind of conflict with the law of God. I mean, we could talk about the conflict, which we will in a minute, of our fallen natures. But I'm talking about just, like, why would a Christian want to get rid of the law of God? Doesn't make sense. It's God's moral standard. So now let's go a little bit beyond that and let's talk about, and this is where some of it, in fact, let's go to Galatians chapter 2. I always like to go to Galatians 2 for this because it's, it's such an emphatic verse. You'll see what I mean when you get there, Galatians 2.16. This is where I think a lot of Christians run into challenges. Um, Christians who think that the law doesn't matter anymore, they say, well, that's what the Apostle Paul says so clearly. For example, in Galatians chapter 2, in verse 16, the apostle says, in fact, we'll start verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not what? Justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the Works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. That's a little bit emphatic, right? What are you trying to get at, Paul? <laughs> that no one is justified by the works of law. Now, here's the challenge that I think some Christians run into. They hear that and they think, well, if nobody can be justified by the works of the law, why do we even need the law? Okay, so let's be clear about something. To be justified is to be made right with God. And, and what Paul's saying is, no amount of you trying to keep the commandments of God is going to make you right with God. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner, right? And so he's, he's making that point. By the works of the law, no, no flesh will be justified. It's by faith in Jesus, which we'll expound on a little bit further as we go. But the idea of that, that being made right with God, Paul says it can't happen through the law. And a lot, of, a lot of Christians say, well, if you can't be justified by the law then you must not need the law anymore. But the law was never given for justification. In other words, when God gave the law to his people, in the Old Testament, it wasn't like, hey, you, you do this, and if you keep this perfectly, then you'll be righteous and you'll live. Like, that wasn't God's plan in giving the law. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, the book of Romans again, Paul says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
right? Why is, why is the knowledge of sin by the law? Because the law is God's standard of right and wrong. How do I know what's wrong to God? By the law. That was the point of the law, which we'll see as we go. So, in fact, think about this for a minute. Take the word justify. We just read it. You heard it. It's a Christian word, very Christian word. It's not only a Christian word, though. So let me ask you this question. Let's say you were to come into a discussion I was having with Robin here. And you walk in the room right when I say, Robin, you're just trying to justify yourself. Have you ever heard that expression before? Without knowing anything else, what do you know Robin is trying to do? Justify himself. <laughs> I mean, another word for that. He's trying to show he's right. He's trying to declare himself right or innocent of something. That's what the word justify means. So in the terms of God, we're talking about justification. We need to be declared innocent from our guilt of sin. So the word justification. Now, how many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this. Don't raise your hands, but I want you to think about it. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you tried to justify yourself? I, I can't imagine there'd be anybody who really hasn't. Okay, some of you are raising your hands anyways. Like, I, I probably a lot of times. So let me ask you this, and think about it carefully. When, what was happening that made you feel you needed to justify yourself? What is it? I heard it over here. An accusation, right? We don't go around just trying to justify ourselves. It's when you feel like you need to. It's when you feel condemned. It's when you feel an accusation. Without an accusation, now listen carefully, without an accusation, there is no need for justification. Right? Justification is, I need to justify myself because I've been accused. Now, here's the big question. Here's the million dollar question. Billion dollar with inflation. What, where does the accusation come from in that context of Christianity? Now, hold on. Don't do it. You know, I'm like, the devil. Okay, now look, the devil's an accuser of the brethren. The Bible says that, but it's, he's also a liar. And the God really doesn't care so much about his accusation. I want to show you the accusation in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse... Let's look at verse... We'll start in verse 9. Romans 3, verse 9 says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks. That's the we and the they, those two groups. Jews and Gentiles. That they are what? All under sin. We've charged that they're all under sin. As it is written, there is what? None righteous, no, not one. Verse 12, they have all turned aside. They have turned together. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does Good, no, not one. Now come to verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that, how many mouths? Every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Question, where does the accusation come from that arraigns us as sinners in the sight of God? The law says it, and it says it to every person. All have sinned, and Paul, said that, Paul goes on to tell us, all have sinned. Now, hold on, look at that again. Notice how he words it. What the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. Think about the language. What does it mean the mouth may be stopped? What are the mouths doing? Justifying themselves. And the, it's, it's our tenet, the act, every mouth is going to be stopped because when you come face to face with the condemnation, like... Really, am I going to get away with saying, but Lord, I didn't do it. But I'm not a sinner. Yes, you are. Now, I want you to understand the point here. Without the condemnation from the law, there's no need for justification. There's no need for it. And so for a Christian going around and talking about how I'm justified in Jesus and the law doesn't matter anymore makes no sense. If there's no law, you don't need justification. The condemnation is gone. And so there's, there's a role that the law plays. That's why in John 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, you remember, he's telling him you need to be born again. And the Bible goes on in John's, John chapter 3 to say, 
that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then Jesus goes on to say, he who does not believe is condemned already. Jesus didn't need to come into the world to condemn the world. The world's already condemned before God because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, this is, so the point is that the, the, the law of God can't justify a person, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist and doesn't have a purpose. Its purpose is to reveal our sin to us. For what reason? Go to Galatians with me again. And we're going to see this all played out then in our passage in Romans 9 and 10. But Galatians chapter 3. Three. Look at verse 22. This is saying very similar to what we just read in Romans 3, by the way. Galatians 3, verse 22. But the scripture has confined all under sin. Uh, King James Version says concluded all under sin. The scripture said that everybody's a sinner. The scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our what? Tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, what a fascinating verse. Here, the law is working in the process of coming to Christ for justification. It's not like, well, there was the law, and now let's get rid of the law, and now we have Jesus. No, the law is what God used to bring us to Jesus so we could be justified by faith in Christ. You follow that? The conviction of sin which comes through the law is what leads us to seek a Savior. So once again, you take the law out of the picture, and what do you lose? You take a society and you have an immoral society that says anything goes, and what do we start to lose? The conviction of sin that leads people to a Savior. No, we don't need God. You start coming to terms with the law of God, suddenly guess what? You're going to need a Savior. And the devil <laughs> had a purpose in this attack on the law of God. In fact, if you read it in the book Great Controversy, it says the last conflict in this world is but the long-standing the, the final struggle in the long-standing controversy, speaking of the great controversy, over the law of God. It's interesting, the book Christ Object Lessons, on page 128, says that no man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel, or the gospel without the law. Listen to this. The law is the gospel embodied. And the gospel is the law unfolded. Interesting. The law is the now think about it. The law is the gospel embodied. If you were able to give a body to the law, what would it look like? This should be an easy one. It's another. It would look like Jesus. Oh, it always bugs me when people say, oh, the Pharisees, they always kept the law. They did not keep the law. Jesus in John 5 says, Moses gave you the law, yet none of you keeps it. I think we keep going on. Even in the average church, like the Pharisees kept the law. They didn't keep the law. They kept their ideas of the law, which was far different. There's only one way that we could see what it looks like to actually obey the law of God, and that's the person of Jesus. If you could take the law and put it in a body, lived out, it would be the life of Jesus. Who doesn't want that? The law is the gospel embodied. The gospel is the law unfolded. The law is the root, and the gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which it bears. God forbid there's Christians who want to get rid of the law of God, the standard of right and wrong that was manifested in the life of Jesus. Now, with that little background, I want to look at this passage and see what Paul's getting at. We're going to go to Romans, right before Romans 10. Chapter breaks weren't in the original. We're going to look at Romans 9, and Paul in Romans 9 is talking about his nation, the Israelites. And as we come to the end of Romans 9, we'll start in verse 30. Romans 9 and verse 30. 
the apostle says, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel pursuing the what? The law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Now, now just that little piece right there. How did the Jews, the Jewish nation, um, how did they pursue the law of righteousness? Say that again. Trying to keep it. Pretty straightforward. The Jewish nation tried to attain to righteousness. We're going to, the law of God is a righteous law, is it not? So if we just go through that and we check every box, there, we're there. They're going to attempt, and so Paul's pointing that out, that the, the Jews attempted, they pursued the law of righteousness, but they never attained to it. They never got where they were wanting to go. They never lived righteous lives, and yet the Gentiles who didn't have all that history, they did because of their faith. Now he started, and he's going to conclude with that too. He started again in verse 30, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, a Gentile was a non-believer, a non-Jew, didn't grow up in it. Anybody here not grow up in a Christian home? Spend time in your life where you did not pursue righteousness. There's a difference between living a life when you're pursuing a righteousness and living a life when you don't. I didn't always pursue righteousness. The Gentiles don't pursue. The people of the world, they're not pursuing righteousness. Righteousness isn't on the high part of the list that they're looking for. They're looking for fun and excitement and whatever else. Righteousness is not in the mix. And, and, and so here Paul says these Gentiles who live these lives for, for pleasure and self, through their connection with Christ, actually attained to righteousness. When they didn't start out seeking it, but the Jews who were seeking it didn't. Why? Verse 32, speaking of Israel. Let's read 31 and 2 again. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek. What didn't they seek by faith? Don't miss this. The law of righteousness. Listen, the law, the law is holy and just and good. The Apostle Paul tells us that in Romans 7. There's nothing wrong with the law. It wasn't altogether wrong to pursue it. The problem is the way they pursued it. They did not pursue it by faith, but as it were, what does he say? By the works of the law. In other words, instead of, <laughs> let's just be clear, faith has an object, right? We talk about faith today. Oh, I have faith. What is faith? Belief, trust, right? What is your faith in? Oh, I just have faith. I talk to people, oh, I just have faith. Faith is just this, ubiqu this, this, this nebulous kind of thing up there. No, faith has an object. And in the Christian life, that faith is in Jesus Christ. I'm trusting in him, in his strength, in his power, in his sacrifice. Did the Jewish nation accept the sacrifice of Christ? So to pursue God's will in God's law wasn't a bad thing inherently, because the Gentiles did the same thing, only they did it by faith in Christ. And Paul's pointing out the problem isn't, again, in verse 32, he doesn't say, you know, they haven't attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought the law of righteousness. They sought righteousness by the works of the law, i.e., by their obedience to the law without the transforming grace of Christ, which you're going to Romans 10. He says, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. What was the stumbling stone? Submitting their lives to Christ. Now, I could ask you right here, what hope is there of you or of me ever obtaining righteousness if I refuse to accept Christ? <laughs> if I refuse to yield myself to Christ? And this is where Paul's frustration is coming from. And so now as we go into Romans 10, he says, brethren, my heart's desire. Oh, no, no, I can't miss 33. Now, he's going to bring 33 up here at the end of uh, chapter 9 and again in a few verses. 
as it is written, he says, they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That little last piece is going to become real clear in a minute. So he says in chapter 10, my brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I mean, there's a whole sermon I could preach on that. There are a lot of people who have a zeal for God. There are people who feel passionate about what they believe about God or Christianity or religion or non-religion. Because a big thing today is there are people who are like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I don't know if you heard that. Because religion and Christianity and churchy things are all like passe, but now I'm spiritual. Okay, there are a lot of people who have a zeal for God, but your zeal is not based on any kind of knowledge. It's not any kind of spiritual knowledge. In other words, I have ideas. Who doesn't have ideas? When Paul says knowledge, he's talking about the knowledge of truth, the scripture. Like, you can have all kinds of ideas about God, but where do they come from? Are they founded in anything substantial? He's bearing witness to the Israelites, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Now notice verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. How do I say that? There's so much that could be said there. It's interesting when you talk about... Now, I told you the law of God, the Ten Commandments, is God's standard of righteousness. But it's... You know, there, there, you can have a concept of righteousness with, with... Like, if you look at the law of God and then you look at it lived out in the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus really, <laughs> pardon the pun, fleshes things out, <laughs> right? Like, it really enhances the picture. You, you, you read, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not, and you're like, yeah, okay. You're not necessarily going to get the full picture of the life of Christ. It's like, it's like my family versus a picture of my family. I can show you a picture of my family, but that's not the same as my family. You understand? The law is like a picture. The Ten Commandments is a picture of God's righteousness, but it's not like the living righteousness. It's in there. But it's not like, and this is what Paul's point, pointing out here. They're being ignorant of God's righteousness. For example, a practical example from the New Testament. Jesus said, you heard it said, you should not murder. But I say to you that you shouldn't hate your brother in your heart. Was that not what the commandment said? Yes, it was implied in the commandment. The problem is there are people who would read, thou shalt not murder, and say, well, I, I, as long as I don't kill him. <laughs> I can't stand that guy. Or adultery. Jesus said, you know, don't, the, the, you've heard it written, it, you said it, you should not commit adultery. I say, if you ever look with lust, well, you know, you could be like looking at lustful things and thinking lustful things all the time, but I haven't done it, I haven't acted on it. And was, Jesus was trying to help them to understand that the righteousness of God was much broader than a checklist. And, and, and I believe that this is what Paul's addressing here. They were ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant to the extent God's righteousness, true righteousness is not just my outward actions. It's my thoughts. It's my intents. And this is something that fallen humanity can never produce. We, we can never change our heart, our intentions, our thoughts. But Christ can. And, 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 and this is what... What Paul's trying to get at here, they were ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, but all the while they were seeking to establish their own righteousness by obeying God's Ten Commandments, what were they doing with God's Son? <laughs> now listen, let me make something really clear. The incarnation of Jesus and his sacrifice on Calvary was not just to pay the penalty for our sins but to bring us righteousness. I mean, let, let's be clear about something. If Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, we say, okay, I'm saved through the blood of Jesus, and I were transported right now into heaven, and you were transported right into heaven, 
And everybody who made that profession were transported at this, transported at this moment right into heaven. What would heaven become? I mean, somehow there's this idea that I'm just going to magically, I guess when I trans get passed through the gates into the city, all of a sudden I'm not going to sin anymore. Because we know I can't keep living up there like I live here, or it would be like this world. Like people get that. But that's what the sacrifice of Christ included, not just paying the penalty, but bringing to us righteousness that we don't have bringing to us a grace that can transform the way we think, transform the way we feel. This, the, the righteousness of Christ is the character of Christ. It's the character of God himself. And so Paul says they're ignorant of God's righteousness, but while being ignorant of God's righteousness, verse 3, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they've not submitted to the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. In other words, they're trying to get to righteousness. Christ is the end, the outcome, the purpose of the law for righteousness. Like here you have the law, but the, the end outcome that you're trying to get to is here, but you're rejecting him. This is the point that Paul's making so plainly here. My people, the Jewish nation, they, they, they say they want righteousness, but the one means to righteousness that God has given, his son Jesus Christ. The purpose of the law is fulfilled in Jesus. The righteousness of the law is lived out in Jesus, but they're rejecting him. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. If you want the righteousness of the law, lived out in your life, you've got to go to Christ. And everyone who believes in him will attain it. Now, what's fascinating here is Paul then goes, and we're going to conclude with this last little section here, but he goes and quotes from a passage in Deuteronomy. I'm going to read it here. We're going to read it in Deuteronomy. Verse 5, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does those things shall live by them. He's quoting from Leviticus. In other words, if you could truly live out everything in the commandments from a pure heart, then righteousness would come that way. The problem is you and I are fallen creatures and there's no way we can do that from the heart. Our hearts are already corrupt. Now it's interesting. He says, Moses writes in verse 5 and then verse 6 he says, but the righteousness of faith, so he contrasts the righteousness which is of the law, that is me trying to get there by the law alone. He contrasts that with what he calls the righteousness of faith. And he says the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. And he begins to quote who? We're going to read it in a minute. It's Deuteronomy. It's Moses. Now, I'm telling you that because you talk to somebody about this passage. Okay, righteousness of the law, that's what Moses taught. But the righteousness of faith is, yeah, what Moses taught. Okay, so Paul begins to quote, we're going to look at Moses in a minute. He says, but the righteousness of faith, verse 6, speaks this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth, right? It's near in your mouth and your heart. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, I want to pick back up on this, but I want to go back and see where he's quoting from in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 9. Just in case you're wondering, we're coming in for a landing. I don't know what your tolerance is. I don't know how long Pastor Jermaine preaches. And sometimes people are like, it's getting to be that time. My stomach's grumbling. And so I don't know what it is here. Just letting you know. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 9. Now, now keep this in mind. When you're studying the Bible and a New Testament author quotes something from the Old Testament, whether it be Christ himself quoting from the Old Testament, if you were quoting something that somebody else wrote, do you generally know the context they were writing in? 
Like if I'm quoting somebody else, am I just like, I don't know, I heard this, I'm not sure what they meant by it, but. No, when you quote something, you're quoting something you're familiar with and it has every bearing on the point you're making. Now, I think we need to be clear. Like sometimes I know people, they read quotes and they read things in the New Testament. They never go back and check out, like, what was the context there? I want you to see this in Deuteronomy 30. We're going to start in verse 9. The Apostle Paul's, uh, Moses, sorry, we're in Moses now. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the, no, 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 let's start in verse uh, uh, 8. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and what? Do all his commandments which I command you today. Incidentally, he's speaking to them at a time when they're not doing the commandments. And he has pointed that out, but he says, you're going to come to this point where you again will do all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, if I were just to tell you that today, you're like, look, you've, you've been rebellious. The Lord has shown, you know, uh, his displeasure and what have you. But the Lord wants to prosper you if you return to him with all your heart and you're faithful to keep his commandments. What's your first thought? Maybe it's different from mine. Okay, let me give the context. You're in a place. Let me make it real practical because it, it happens to us all the time. You're in a place where you just did that thing again. You keep telling the Lord you won't do. You don't want to do it. That sin that so easily besets you. And now the Lord says, hey, look. Or Moses says to you, hey, God wants to restore you and bless you as long as you're faithful to keep his commandments. What's your first thought? I blew it and what? When you blow it, do you start questioning your ability to do right? Have you ever started to question your own sincerity? Book Steps to Christ tells us that. We often find ourselves, we question our own sincerity. I mean, I've said it before and I keep falling to it. I keep saying I'm not going to do it and I do it again. Then you start to question if you can ever be faithful to God. It's interesting to me that you can talk cultures and time and, you know, young people today, well, you don't understand what it's like with, with, when, when, when we had, uh, you know, you didn't have TikTok in your day. But let me tell you something. Human beings have still been the same throughout. There are different ways and the devil packages temptation, but the carnal heart is the same. And the things we wrestle with down at the root level are the same, and the doubts we have about being faithful to God are the same. And you'll see that that's just the case here. Now, Moses just shared with these people, if you're faithful to the Lord, notice what he says in verse 11. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it... Far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven and bring it to us, that we may hear and do it. Notice the focal point here. We want to do it, but what do you think he's addressing? What do you think the feeling of the people is? We want to do it, but it's so out of reach. It's so far. Moses says, the word I'm speaking to you, it's not so far off that it's out of reach for you. This is what he's addressing. Verse 13, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. What's he telling them? What's Moses' point to the people? I know I'm telling you to be faithful to God. I know you're questioning whether you have the ability to do it, but I'm telling you it's within your reach. It's not so far off. It's not impossible for you to do this. Do you think Paul understood the point when he quoted it? Now let's go back to Romans 10 and conclude our thoughts here. Romans chapter 10. Again, he's talking about the Jewish nation who needed to attain to righteousness, and they hadn't because they'd rejected Christ. And in rejecting Christ, 
they had not attained to the righteousness of the law. They were not living righteous lives. And incidentally, the Bible says the unrighteous in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 7, if I have it right, 6, will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's no unrighteous people going to be saved. It's a requirement for salvation. And so you go back to Romans chapter 10, his burden. Their zeal for God has them pursuing a righteousness, but it's not the righteousness of God. They've not submitted to the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. They've not submitted to Christ to receive his righteousness. Now, he says, verse 6, the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What I'm telling you that the Jews have still not attained to with all of their privileges is not out of reach for them or for you. It's not a far off that you can't. It's in your heart and in your mouth if you'll confess the Lord Jesus. Now, some translations say it this way. Confess Jesus as Lord. These are so cliched. What does it mean, the word Lord? It means master. What does it mean if you call somebody your master. That means you're going to do what? Do, you're going to do what they say. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus, I'm going to do what you say, and I believe you're who God said he would send you, the Messiah, you're the Savior of the world, will you be saved? Can you not be saved if you confess Jesus as Lord? I'm not talking about lip service. I'm saying, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, and I believe that you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Can you not be saved? Listen, saints, this is, notice what he goes on to say here. It, 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 we're not done with his thought. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice, for with the heart one believes, notice that next part, unto righteousness. What does unto mean? That means your belief is going to transport you into an experience of right. In other words, it brings the righteousness of Christ into your life. You believe unto, it's not just this aimless belief. When I believed in Jesus, when I first accepted Christ, he changed my life and has been changing my life ever since. If you've given your heart to Jesus, you know the story. If you haven't, you're struggling in vain. Submit. <laughs> your life to Jesus, and he will begin to do in your life what nothing else can. He awakens spiritual desires. He gives spiritual strength, right? One believes unto, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In other words, when I confess the Lord as Jesus as my Lord and Master, when I believe in him with all my heart, it produces something. Unto righteousness, unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will what? Now, now, now notice again in chapter 9, verse 9, verse 31 and 32. It says, Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. But because they didn't believe in him, what? Now, now, now get the idea here. If I claim to be a follower of God, and I claim to have the righteousness of God, when I'm put to the test, if I've not submitted to Christ, what's going to show up? My, my claim is faulty, and I'm going to be put to shame. You understand? 
There's no other road but being put to shame if I've not submitted to Christ because I can't get to the destination. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Christ is the only way to the destination of righteousness. So he, he, he has it in that sense with the Jewish nation. They hadn't submitted to Christ. But for anybody who will, here in Romans 10... Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Unlike the Jewish nation, if we put our trust in Jesus, choose to live for him, we don't have to worry about a righteous life being so far off out of our reach that we can never attain it. We don't have to worry that we're not going to make it to heaven if we put our trust in Christ. Whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. Amen? Let me share with you a statement here. In closing, Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. Right? Right? He said of himself, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. This is found in Christ's Object Lessons 3.11. He said to his disciples on earth, I have kept my Father's commandments, John 15.10. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. What if I don't have him? What if I don't accept him? Then it's impossible. And then I am like that futile Jewish nation who wanted to get the righteousness of God, but they didn't want to surrender to Christ to do it. Listen, we could, we could talk about the world today. I mean, a lot of people want to live a good life, be a good person. I talk to people who are not even Christians. They, if there's an afterlife, some believe, some don't believe. It's funny to me, actually, how many people, even professed atheists, when you get into conversation, have some element of afterlife. Like, how does that work? And when you talk to him about it, the bottom line is, well, I try to live like a good person. <laughs> that, that's, that, whether you're Jew or Gentile, that living like a, that's you trying to establish your own righteousness. You're not going to make it. You're going to stumble at that stumbling stone. But if you surrender to Christ, by his perfect obedience, he made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, then the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. And we live his life. This is what the Apostle Paul meant in Galatians 2 when he says, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's what he promises to do for us. But without that, there's no hope of attaining righteousness. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe, to everyone who believes. She concludes, this is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. That having the will merged in his will and the heart united with his heart and living his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment that Adam and Eve wove together, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. When we surrender to Christ, he transforms our life. We stand before God as if we never sinned. More than that, our lives are brought into harmony with the law that still is the law of heaven, the great standard of right and wrong. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen? Now, I don't know, brothers and sisters, where you are today. I would hope and pray, but I'll ask the question, how many of you want to say today, it doesn't matter where you were before today, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to submit to him. I don't want to stumble at that stumbling stone. I want him in charge of my life. Is that your desire today? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Father, as we've meditated upon these things, first and foremost, we're so thankful for your word and for your law that gives us a clear picture of right and wrong. Not an arbitrary law, Lord, a law that brings 
and is intended to bring life and joy and happiness. But more than this, Father, we are thankful that you sent your son Jesus, that in his life he lived a perfect life to that law, and he gives his righteousness to all who believe in him. That through Jesus we can be transformed and live new lives. That the righteousness that we seek is not so far away that we can't attain it. But by confessing the Lord Jesus, believing in our hearts, in his righteousness, putting our trust in him, we never need to be put to shame. But when you come again, Jesus, in the clouds of glory, we can say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. And we can rejoice in that day. Father, we thank you for these privileges. We ask you to bless us through the remaining hours of the Sabbath. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, I'm going to ask if you would stand with me and turn to our hymn of response. As our brother is going to lead out for us, number 488, at first I prayed for light. At first I prayed for light, could I but see the way, how gladly, swiftly would I walk to everlasting day. And next I prayed for strength, that I I might tread the road with firm on faltering feet and win the heaven abode. And then I asked for faith, could I but trust my God, I'd live with Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. 